this is my first event with Shell Game. It's my first attempt to talk about the novel in a public setting. The novel, uh, I sometimes feel that my books are like a suitcase that someone is trying to get too many clothes into, and that when it's shut, there's always a bra strap or a pair of blue jeans hanging out over the side, and Shell Game is no exception. Chapter One, Babe in the Woods. The deputy turned without warning into an uncut thicket. Felix and I stumbled after him, following his bobbing flashlight as best we could. The suckers from the bushes and trees snapped back to whip our faces. When I called to the deputy to slow down, he merely picked up his pace. The meager light from my phone wasn't much use. I skidded on a pile of wet leaves and tumbled into a thorny bush. Mud squelched over the tops of my shoes, down into my socks. Felix tried to free me, but he ended up tangling his own scarf in the brambles. The deputy was well ahead of us by the time we extricated ourselves, but we could still see slices of his light through the trees and beyond those the glow of arc lamps. I pushed toward them through the undergrowth. The deputy was standing behind one of the arc lamps. He looked around in annoyance when we arrived and said, about time and called to someone beyond the light. Got the kid, boss. He brought someone with him. Claims she's a lawyer. That's because I am a lawyer, I said, my voice bright. I'll bring them over. The boss had a gravelly voice, hoarse. Felix shoved his hands deep into his pockets and stumbled after me into the clearing. He tripped on a branch and nearly fell, but brushed aside my arm when I tried to steady him. He was usually a lively young man, as easy with my generation as with his peers, but he'd barely spoken since I'd picked him up an hour earlier. Nerves. Understandable. But when I'd tried probing, why did the sheriff's, <clears throat> excuse me, <coughs> why did the sheriff's police think Felix could identify a dead person? Was one of his friends missing? He snapped at me to be quiet. The deputy pushed us towards a man of about 50, jowly, heavy, but not fat. Lieutenant Bars were on the shoulders of his uniform jacket. Felix Herschel, the lieutenant grunted, adding to me, you're the lawyer? V.I. Warshawski, I said. The lieutenant ignored my offered hand. Why'd the kid need to lawyer up? You got something to hide, son? Innocent people don't need lawyers. Innocent people need lawyers more than the guilty lieutenant. They don't understand the criminal justice system, and for forceful interrogators can intimidate them into bogus confessions. So let's talk about what Mr. Herschel can do for you here. The lieutenant, McGivney, I read on his badge, studied me, decided not to fight that battle, and jerked his head toward the, cor toward the center of the arc lamps. Yeah, bring your client over, Warshawski. Make sure you both walk in my footsteps. We want to minimize contamination of the crime scene. He stopped near a log where the arc lamps were concentrated. The log was over three feet high at the base, the remnant of some old oak or ash that had crashed in the woods. The bark had rotted to a rusty brown, and a black tarp covered its base, and a lump beyond it. McGivney nodded at a crime scene tech. She pulled the tarp back to display the bruised and swollen body of a man. He'd been stuffed headfirst into the hollow bottom of the log. The body's original position was outlined in white. Only his feet and part of his legs had been visible, but the deputies had pulled him out. He was dressed in blue jeans and a dirt-crusted hoodie, unzipped to show a badly beaten torso. He'd been beaten so savagely that his head was a pulpy mess. His hair might once have been brown, but was too caked now with mud and blood, to be sure. My muscles clenched. Violent death. Nauseating death. Next to me, Felix made a feral, gurgling sound. His face was pale, glassy, and he was swaying. I put one hand on the small of his back 
and pulled his head down roughly to his knees, pressing his face as close to them as I could. Do you have water, Lieutenant? I asked. No, and I'm not carrying smelling salts either. McGivney gave a shark-like smile. Do you recognize the body, son? Why do you think Mr. Herschel knows him? I said before Felix could speak. I had warned him in the car to consult me before he answered questions, but in the shock of death, he wouldn't remember. McGivney's mouth bunched in annoyance. We have a good reason. Eh, perhaps you do, but aside from being pretty sure this is a man, I don't know how anyone could identify him without DNA or dental records. And if you just found him, you couldn't have any of that information already. Do you recognize him, Mr. Herschel? McGivney was keeping control of his temper, but it showed in his clenched jaw muscles. Felix was looking away from the clearing, away from the body. His color had improved, but his expression was still glassy. McGivney grabbed his shoulders. Do you know this man? Felix blinked. Who is it? That's why we asked you out here. We figured you knew. I removed the sheriff's hand from Felix's arm. He said he doesn't know the dead man, which means we are done here, Lieutenant. We're done when I say we're done, McGivney snapped. Oh, please. You've given us zero reason for hauling Mr. Herschel out here at two in the morning. We've looked at a murdered man. We felt the horror of his death, which you no doubt intended. Neither of us has seen him before. We can't help you. Good night, Lieutenant. I took Felix's arm and turned him around, telling him to step in the footprints we'd followed in. Why did the guy have Herschel's name and phone number in his jeans? McGivney demanded. Felix looked at me, his dark eyes wide with fear. I muttered to him, don't say anything, before calling over my shoulder to McGivney. I'm not a medium, so unfortunately, I can't answer any questions about this poor dead man's acts or motives. You're at a murder site, not Comedy Central, Warshawski, McGivney snapped. Your client needs to explain his connection to the dead man. I turned around. My client told you he has no connection. If your search of the body turned up a phone with Mr. Herschel's name on it, then you can learn his identity without any help from us. It was on a scrap of paper, McGivney said. If we can look at it, we might be able to help you. I used the soothing voice of a kindergarten teacher. McGivney frowned, but he was a reasonable cop, just one I'd pushed on harder than he liked. He beckoned one of the techs who produced a labeled evidence envelope removed from left front jeans pocket, 1.17 a.m. Inside was a scrap of paper with Felix's cell phone number, handwritten with such care that the numbers looked like artwork. What do you know about this, Herschel? McGivney demanded. Felix looked at me, his face alight with fear. I felt sure he recognized the writing. It's been torn from a bigger sheet of paper, I said quickly, before Felix could give himself away. Good quality, too, not just a post-it or notebook. Hey, you're Sherlock Holmes, McGivney growled. Eh, no monographs on paper stock, Lieutenant, just observation and experience. And how do your observations and experience explain why your client's number is in the Vic's pocket? Still no crystal ball, Lieutenant. Who found the body? It was shoved into that log, right? And there's no direct path into that clearing. McGivney sighed. Ah, eh, high school kids out smoking and drinking. Weed, beer, vodka, cigarettes. Be a while before they do that again. You don't think they killed him themselves? Some Lord of the Flies fantasy that ran out of control? What, and came back to get stoned at the scene and celebrate the murder? They were scared shitless. Whoever killed him didn't want him found, I said. You think? McGivney's upper lip curled in derision. Yeah, let me know if you have any other insights, Sherlock. I followed him up the stone stairs to the second floor and down the hall to Candrafan Fleet's office. Someone had already placed, replaced the broken glass in her door. I tried the knob. The door was locked. Sanson was getting out his keys, but I stopped him and used a credit card to press the lock tongue back. 
They didn't have to break the glass, I said. Whoever went in was making a statement. Did the police pick up prints? Sanson shook his head. They say the intruder wore gloves. I stepped aside to let Sanson enter first. When he'd turned on a light, I took a quick look around. But so many Leos had been there that uh, through there that the main residue of the crime was fingerprint dust and empty DNA swab kits, some labeled FBI, others ICE and Interpol. Professor Van Fleet said she was on her way to Philadelphia. Is she there now, I asked? An antiquities conference. Ironic in a grim way, I suppose our, uh, I suppose our brief ownership of the Dagon will be the main conference topic. Was anything else taken from the Institute besides her eight-breasted goddess and the Dagon figure? Sanson smiled sardonically. No one's reported anything, and no one else's office was broken into, but I can guess that for the next five months, every time someone has mislaid an inscription or a prized bead, it will be blamed on the thieves. I made a slow circuit of the room, feeling like an actor playing Sherlock Holmes in an amateur drama. I stopped at the window to look out, expecting to see either the chapel bell tower or 58th Street, but I was looking down at an interior courtyard. Ground lights showed a, a sorry, these reading glasses are not doing the job for me. Uh, ground lights showed a green sward with a few trees and bushes surrounded by cobblestones. I tried a window latch, and the casement opened smoothly without squeaking. Sanson watched while I shone my flashlight around outside the window. Hold my legs, will you? I want to look farther down the wall. He cocked his head. You're not joking? No, but I should have asked, can you hold my legs? I don't want both of us tumbling to our deaths. Well, it's not the strangest thing archaeology has demanded of me. Roll up your pants. I'm going to hold your left leg above the ankle. If my hands slip, they'll catch on your shoe. I rolled my trousers up and knelt on the radiator under the window. The old cast iron sections cut through my trousers into my knees, but in a moment, Sanson had seized me in a strong grip. I inched over the stone sill. When I was hanging upside down, the blood rushed to my head and my hands sweated on the flashlight. I blinked back the spots dancing in front of my eyes and shone my flash on the wall. Pull me back up, I shouted. Samson kept one hand on my leg and grabbed my waistband with the other. The fabric ripped, but I had my left hand on the sill and lowered myself back into the office. My arms and legs were trembling. I collapsed onto a chair and massaged my arms. I felt the back of my trousers where the fabric had split and not along a seam. Second pair of pants I've damaged on this investigation. You have strong hands for which, believe me, I am grateful. Sanson grinned. You often do Batwoman impersonations? It's my second favorite party trick. But I'm afraid this is how your perp got into the building. I can see the marks on, in the wall where he or she inserted holds, and there are scuffs about a yard below the sill. It could have come from climbing shoes. The scar along Sanson's jawline pulsed redder. After a long pause, he said, Someone here in the Institute gave precise instructions. I'm afraid so. They smashed glass in the door as a misdirection. Didn't that noise rouse your security? The office is pretty remote from the lobby. Guard waits for normal robbers to come in through the front door ground floor windows, which all have alarms on them anyway. You don't think your guard... Horace has worked for, here for 17 years. I trust him absolutely. I believe Candrif and Fleet staged the whole thing before I'd accuse Horace. Could she have staged it? She could have delivered the package, after all. Sanson glared at me. Absolutely not. Anyway, why go through a charade like that? If not the guard, if not the professor. Yeah, I know. Someone else who works here or studies here. We sat in an uncomfortable silence for some minutes. Finally, Sanson shook his head. I can't believe we had all of those 
uh, I can't believe we had all these FBI and Interpol idiots here today, and none of them thought to hang upside down when it was daylight and easy. Why the hell do I pay taxes anyway? Sorry about your trousers. My arms had stopped trembling, although my legs were a bit wobbly when I stood. I rubbed my hip, the spot where I'd landed last week. It's a very physical book. My hip had been healing nicely, but was now reminding me that I wasn't 30 anymore. I could use a drink, Sanson said when we were back in the hall. You a teetotaler? I have been known to sip scotch in a bat-womanly way. What's that like? He cocked his head, eyes amused. Mm, you know, as if you were daintily helping yourself to someone's blood. Thank you very much. In the beginning, maybe the first five, six novels, I would see, like, the mountaintop is this central action point. There had to be a big action. In the second book, it's when a freighter blows up in the, in the Sault Ste. Marie locks. Um, and then I would have to know how the book ended. And I would write to the middle, and I would write to the end. I don't plot. I don't outline. I have a story idea. But those would be my focal points. When I found myself with a book where I couldn't see the middle or the end, I really panicked and um, just drove myself crazy, stopped writing, couldn't make it work. And then finally, I, I got some sense of freedom to just write and go with it and see, see where the story, how the story unfolded. I always start with the idea of a crime. I know what it is. I know why it was committed, but how to work it out and how the characters evolve, that is very much an ongoing part of the process. For me, the hardest part of writing, actually, is thinking, becoming interior. When I know what I'm saying, I write really fast. Not as fast as I did when I was young. When I was young, I could write 5,000 words a day. Now, a good day for me is 2,000 words. But a lot of days, it's five words, because I'm, I, I just can't figure out what I'm doing. If I were speaking it out, I'd break that interiority. And, and wouldn't be able to do it. But that's just me. I used to feel that I needed, I think of, I think pace, keeping an even pace is one of the most important ingredients of a really good thriller or crime novel. There's a tendency, I think of it physically, like a freight train climbing a mountain uh, fully loaded, and it takes a lot to get it to the top of the mountain. And then there's a tendency to just let it go and have it rattle down the mountain to the valley. And that's just annoying when you're reading a, a thriller. That, that action just, there's so much action in the last hundred pages that, uh, that it loses its impact. So you have to keep a hand on the throttle, so to speak, all the way up and all the way down, and keep the pace steady, even while you're increasing tension. Well, there's a way in which when you're, when you're creating fictional characters, the only um, thing you have to draw on is yourself and the people that you know. So there, there's always a way in which aspects of myself or the people that I know show up in characters. Anytime you see someone with frizzy hair, uh, that's me. Um, my middle, middle name is Nancy, and I sometimes, if there's a character named Nancy, that's my, my avatar in, in the novels. VI is not really autobiographical. VI says the things that I would say are in the balloon over my head although there is a degree to which we both lack impulse control. I wrote a lot very privately. I never imagined myself having a public voice until, I would say, until second wave feminism kind of swept me off my feet and made me start 
thinking seriously about voice and image and what I wanted to see happening with a with a woman in a in a crime novel. I just can't imagine living any place but here. I, I was thinking the other day about this because um, my very young life, I thought I would end up, I used to lie on the floor in my parents' drafty, dusty house in the middle of Kansas cornfields, reading The New Yorker and imagining that there I'd be in one of those glamorous upstairs of the downstairs or downstairs of the upstairs. and. Um, wearing that mink coat that they used to advertise, what becomes a legend most? Yes, that would have been me. <laughs> and if it wasn't New York, it was going to be London or Paris. Um, and then I came here, I came here as a volunteer in the civil rights movement. I ended up making Chicago home. And when I first started writing my first book, um, you know, it's just Chicago is a shot in a beer kind of town and that is my personality. I'm, I, my husband used to say that I was a pit dog who would go down and bite anyone in the calf as long as they were four times my size. Um, and that just, uh, I, I just can't, uh, New York crime is, financial crime is more dangerous in New York than here, uh, for sure, but it's also slicker. And following it, unraveling it, uh, you, you, you don't want a shot in a beer kind of personality. When, um, when my, I was lucky that Stuart Kaminsky's agent agreed to represent me and when he was sending my first book out, there were actually, I, my, the Newberry houses my papers so I, I don't have the letter anymore, it's, it's there, but there was an editor who actually said that um, uh, private eye fiction only worked in New York or, or, or Los Angeles, San Francisco, and that anyway, not enough people read in the Midwest to make it um, <laughs> profitable to publish a book set here. Uh, so, um, so I definitely belong in, in this place with that kind of attitude on my shoulder. Thank you very much.